skiing in Bridger Bowl, I learned how to ride a lot of sloughs out of the gullies there. I mean, I got sloughed out of there about 50 times at Bridger Bowl. I thought it was fun until I got in a big one. That's how naive I was. Uh, another guy traversed in above him, and all the snow started to slide. So I went to rest myself, and before I knew it, I couldn't rest myself. I was in the air. And he'd pretty much flown over a, you know, 50, 60 foot cliff. I just figured I was dead. And the thing just, it was turning me every which way, any way it wanted it to. The force was so, so tremendous. Each year, an average of 24 people die in avalanches in North America. Over 100 people are caught in them, and hundreds of people unintentionally trigger avalanches. On the average, more people die each year in avalanches than from either hurricanes or earthquakes. And the death toll continues to rise. Even in the recent past, avalanches had the reputation of being mysterious and unpredictable. But today, at ski areas and on the slopes above highways, highly trained avalanche professionals practice the well-developed technology of avalanche forecasting and control. After carefully monitoring the snowpack and the weather, each morning they trigger avalanches with explosives before the public arrives. As a result, almost all avalanche fatalities occur in the backcountry or areas outside of ski area boundaries where the only choice is to become your own avalanche expert or suffer the consequences. The typical avalanche victim is a skier, snowmobiler, snowboarder, climber, or hiker. Almost all avalanche victims are skilled at their sport, but the critical difference is that the skill in their sport has significantly outpaced their avalanche skills. Often just a little amount of avalanche education would have made the difference. In the following hour, we will talk with 15 prominent avalanche professionals who make their living in hazardous avalanche terrain, and they will explain not only how avalanches work, but exactly how they keep themselves and others alive. Backcountry skiers are leading the list by far. It seems like uh, if, if you look at the trend in these statistics over the last 40 years, uh, certainly lift skiers and climbers were leading the list a long time ago. But in the last 10 years, let's say the decade of the 80s, Boy, ski tours, and this would be your ski mountaineers, really started leading the list. And I think there's a definite trend that snowmobilers are on the rise. The snowmobilers that now are really of a different breed than they used to be. The machines are a lot faster, they're a lot more powerful, they're lower to the ground, they've got wider tracks, and they can climb a heck of a lot better than snow machines ever were able to climb before. They're able to get far into the backcountry and get up into these large bowls, and they're able to climb steeper and steeper slopes. We see every year, I think, probably a 20% increase in the number of snowboarders caught by avalanches. We've done a profile of the average avalanche victim, and it turns out to be a white male, 27 years old, a superb athlete, and would not spend any time at all digging a snow pit or learning more about snow because that was time taken away from his sport, uh, which usually was going to be skiing, it might be snowmobiling. But this would be the average profile. Most of the people, in fact, 95% of the time, the avalanche is triggered by the victim. That's right, 95% of the time. So we've met the enemy and the enemy is us. And that's good because we have a choice. We have a choice of whether we stay out of avalanches or not. Avalanches come in all different sizes and types. For example, one is loose snow avalanches where they start just usually from a point and then they go down and fan outwards. Those can be dry snow or wet snow, both. And not too many people get caught or hurt in loose snow avalanches, but you can get caught in them. For example, if you get, if you get taken over a cliff or into some trees or buried into a train trap, they can be really nasty. Another type would be um, ice fall avalanches. And the problem with ice falls is you don't really have an ability to, to uh, try to forecast when they're going to occur. You can't really do a stability evaluation. You're pretty much totally rolling the dice. Um, temperature doesn't really play that much um, of a factor as well as the time of the day. 
like a lot of people think it is. So you gotta really pay attention on where you're going, whether it's an ice fall 5,000 feet above you, um, you, you gotta think of how far down it's gonna go and how far the runout can be. The kind of avalanche that catches by far the most people are slab avalanches. Those are the kind we have to worry about. Slab avalanches are so dangerous because they let you get out into the middle of the slab and then they break and the crack forms up above you and then off you go, you're on for the ride of your life. Snow begins its life as it falls from the sky. Different combinations of temperature, relative humidity, and wind create an almost infinite variety of snowflakes. Some types of new snow bond well to the surrounding snow, while other types bond quite poorly. Light, cold snow, for instance, tends to form weak layers within the new snow. Warm, dense snow, or wind-blown snow, on the other hand, will form strong, dense layers. Strong snow overlaying weak snow creates a slab. If the weight of the slab overloads the strength of a varied weak layer, the weak layer fractures and creates an avalanche. Weak layers can also form in other ways. One of the more common weak layers is frost or surface hoar. It grows like sparkling feathers on the snow surface during clear, calm and humid conditions. Once buried, it acts as a dangerous weak layer, which can persist in the snowpack for a long time. Because surface hoar grows best when exposed to a clear sky, it tends to grow in open terrain as opposed to in the forest. Another common weak layer is the dreaded faceted snow, which also goes by many other names such as depth hoar, sugar snow, temperature gradient snow, or squares. Instead of falling from the sky, it grows within the snowpack itself because of large temperature and density differences within the snowpack. The resulting crystals can grow quite large with angular faces which sparkle like fine diamonds and they form a structure like the proverbial house of cards. When overloaded, any sudden jolt can bring the fragile house tumbling down. Once formed, Faceted crystals remain weak for a notoriously long time. During wet snow conditions, weak layers can also form within the snow from percolating water. When rain falls on snow, or surface snow is melted by strong sun or warm temperatures, percolating water dissolves the bonds between the grains of snow. Also, when water saturates a layer of snow, such as above an ice crust, suddenly the snow loses all its strength and can become a wet slab avalanche. So if you have a slab and you have a weak layer and you have a bed surface, do you have an avalanche? Well, we see these kinds of unstable layers all the time and you don't necessarily have an avalanche. In order to have one, you have to have a critical balance between stress and strength. Before there's an avalanche, that snowpack is being held on mostly by the sheer friction and the sheer strength associated with what will become the bed surface once that avalanche has failed. Let's consider what happens if we have a snow layer that's loaded up, but it's still carrying the weight of that overloaded snow. But something like a skier or a snowmobiler comes along and locally damages that crystal. That could be sufficient to start an avalanche too. The important thing in the failure of the bed surface of an avalanche is you don't have to be at the top to make it start. You can get that failure started anywhere on the avalanche slab and it'll travel almost like a wave along that bed surface and eventually fracture out the entire bed surface. So that initial failure can start down low in the slab or up near the top of the slab. The very first question that you need to ask when you're traveling in the backcountry is, is the terrain capable of producing an avalanche? Because if the answer is no, then you don't need to worry about any of the rest of the stuff. If you look at uh, all of uh, the avalanche accident data, it turns out that the slope angle on which a victim is most likely going to get caught on is 38 degrees, right in that level. Very seldom are people triggering avalanches on slopes less than 35 degrees. 
and seldom does it seem like it's much more than 45 degrees. 38 is right there at the bullseye. One way to judge the steepness of a slope is to compare it with the steepness of a slope at a ski area. For instance, an intermediate slope is about 30 degrees, which is barely steep enough to avalanche. An expert or black diamond slope is about 35 degrees, where avalanches begin to occur much more frequently. Avalanche activity increases dramatically as the slope steepness rises above 35 degrees and reaches its maximum at 38 degrees. Only the very steepest slopes at a ski area, or double black diamond slopes, are 40 degrees. On slopes steeper than 45 or 50 degrees, the snow sloughs off so frequently that it doesn't tend to build up into dangerous slabs. For this reason, avalanche danger actually decreases on slopes steeper than 45 or 50 degrees. But then again, only the very skilled extreme skiers can negotiate slopes of 45 degrees or steeper. In other words, 30 degrees is barely steep enough to slide, yet avalanche danger reaches a maximum at 38 degrees. This difference of only 8 degrees may not seem important to humans, but it makes a huge difference to the avalanches. For this reason, avalanche professionals quickly develop a very keen eye for judging those very important 8 degrees. When in doubt, carry a relatively inexpensive compass with an inclinometer built into it, a simple device which measures the steepness of a slope. The next most important terrain factor is judging the effect of wind. Wind erodes snow from the upwind side of any obstacle, such as a ridge, and deposits that same snow on the downwind side. Wind can deposit snow ten times more rapidly than snow falling on a sheltered slope, and it can quickly overload buried weak layers. Wind-loaded snow is often dense, stiff, and hollow-sounding like a drum. Wind slabs can range from being very soft to so hard that you can hardly kick a boot into them. Wind can not only create dangerous wind slabs near ridges, but it commonly crossloads onto the sides of gullies, or any other subtle variation in the terrain. Often the difference of only a foot or two can separate ecstasy from disaster. The bottom line, always avoid recent deposits of wind-drifted snow on slopes steep enough to slide. I went back and I looked at another report and I started coming up more and more mentioning this one area of slab that as they've always seen go and now I know it's the depositional area created by the coal as the wind comes over the back of the coal um, it loses a lot of speed and dumps the snow on the other side. Wind loading usually creates what looks like kind of a fat deposit of snow near the top of the slope. It's kind of a pillowed area. It looks like it's uh, kind of rounded, kind of a hardened appearance to the snow, kind of chalky appearance, real thick. What direction the slope faces with respect to sun is also very important. Because sun-exposed slopes are warmer than shaded ones, in dry snow conditions, the sun-exposed slopes tend to settle and stabilize more quickly after a storm. The colder temperatures on shaded slopes not only allow weak layers to persist longer, but weak layers of faceted snow commonly grow as well. Consequently, in a cold, dry climate, shaded slopes tend to be more persistently dangerous. Just the opposite scenario develops if the sunshine is strong enough to melt the snow surface. Then the sun-exposed slopes often develop hazardous wet slide conditions while the shady slopes often remain colder and more stable. Another terrain factor is elevation. Spending time on the, the big peaks of the Alaska Range, another interesting factor is the fact that you've got such a huge elevation regime. An evaluation that you may have made up high on the mountains is not necessarily at all applicable to something lower down in the glacier, where you can get temperature differences um, of 10 to 20 below zero on the summit, and at 7,000 feet, you're sweltering in 65 degree heat. Trees or rocks which stick up through the snowpack are called anchors. If they're thick enough, they can effectively hold the snowpack in place. A thick forest of spruce trees, for instance, can prevent nearly any avalanche from starting. However, it can't keep avalanches from starting above the forest or prevent them from running through the forest. 
As a general rule, anchors are effective only if they are thick enough where you can barely ski through them. Otherwise, their only value is something to grab onto if the slope does slide. But if you can't grab a tree, then it suddenly becomes your worst enemy. But the danger is if you get caught in an avalanche in the forests, then all those anchors then end up being these giant baseball bats that just club you to death as you ride down through the forest. The final terrain consideration is, what are the consequences of a slide? Where are you going to go if, if a small slab knocks you off your feet? Are you going to go over a cliff? Are you going to go into a crevasse? Are you going to go into an ice fall or over an ice fall? And these are things that a lot of people don't think about. Another type of dangerous terrain trap is a narrow gully. Although it doesn't look very imposing, even a small slide triggered on the side of the gully will bury a victim very, very deeply in the bottom of the gully. And it's almost impossible to survive a burial deeper than six feet. The reality is the snowpack stable about 90% of the time. And that's where timing comes in, um, is recognizing that other 10% of the time uh, when the snowpack is unstable. If you're skiing the same way 100% of the time, you know, one out of 10 times you're going to get uh, into trouble. But if you have the skills to recognize those unstable periods that other 10% of the time, then you're going you're to be able to ski safely 100% of the time. The ultimate question is, will the slope slide? The answer is that any slope can slide. It depends on the amount of force applied to it. For instance, on a very stable snowpack where a skier is perfectly safe, the fall of a large cornice might be enough force to trigger an avalanche. As snow becomes less stable, a skier might barely get down safely, while on the same slope, a medium-sized cornice might trigger an avalanche. In the next step up the instability scale, both a cornice and a skier may trigger an avalanche, but if left undisturbed, the snowpack could remain in place indefinitely. Finally, at the top of the instability scale, natural spontaneous avalanches begin to occur. And this, of course, is the most obvious sign of instability. I mean, if you see an avalanche come down, <laughs> it's pretty obvious <laughs> that you've got an unstable situation. Although we say it's obvious, you'd be surprised how some people manage to avoid the obvious by overlooking this. <laughs> The problem that you're faced with when you're traveling in the backcountry is one of uncertainty. And you really have two choices. Um, one is that you can just charge blindly ahead. And that would be similar to finding the busiest street in a town that you lived in and going across it without looking both ways and listening for the traffic. The other one is to seek information from a variety of clues, a variety of sources, and piece that information, integrate it. And what you're doing is you're looking for the most meaningful information you can find. That's the information that's going to re reduce your uncertainty. So let's say that you're standing on the edge of a steep snow-filled slope. Picture that you have a big circle, and within that circle is all of the information available to you. One of those pieces of information might be the temperature outside is 12 degrees. Well, if I tell you that, you're going to say, great. What does that do? What does that tell me about whether or not this slope is safe to ski? Now, another information, if I draw, if I draw another circle and I say, um, oh, there have been north winds blowing and there's a foot of powder on the ground and you're on a southerly slope. Well, maybe that slope is loading. That information might come from the middle of the circle. Now, if you're standing on the edge of that steep snow-filled slope and all of a sudden the slope goes, harumph, and a sister path right next to that one releases to the ground right in front of you. Well, that tells you a lot to eliminate your uncertainty. And what you're doing, this is called the bullseye approach. And what you're trying to do when you're seeking information in the backcountry is go for the bullseye. Go for the information that's going to let you know whether or not that slope is safe. Clues include avalanche activity on similar slopes and similar aspects. It might be a rumping noise, which is a collapse of a weak layer. It might be a hollow sound telling you there's some kind of weaker, less dense layer underneath. It might be a shooting crack telling you that the snow is capable of storing elastic energy of propagating fractures. You're not going to necessarily have all those clues at once, but you'll have some combination. And you're also asking, is the weather contributing to instability? And the big three weather factors are temperature, wind, and precipitation. And of those, precipitation and wind are probably the major ones. Any rapid change in the mechanical or thermal energy state of the snowpack is, is a precursor of avalanching. If the snow just sits there and nothing's happening, nothing is apt to happen. 
But as soon as you get deposition of a new layer of snow, or either by wind drift or by precipitation, a rapid change in uh, uh, the temperature of the snow packet, temperatures below freezing. Uh, I emphasize rapid. And if you look at the, forecast, the, for, the uh, occurrence of avalanches, again and again, you see that they're preceded by, by some sort of a rapid change in the energy state of the snow pack. Probably the key question for snow stability in respect to temperature is, is it above or below freezing? If it's above freezing, you're dealing with wet snow conditions, and you have a whole different pattern of snow avalanche release than if you're dealing with cold snow. Wet snow is, is fascinating. It, we have a lot of rain on snow events that can close our mountain passes for days at a time, and those are so obvious that you wouldn't even be in the backcountry. So you can't even get to the backcountry because it's closed by avalanches. With a lot of the, the, the uh, topography on Mount McKinley, you have these phenomenal ice or solar balls, which, which have nothing but um, white snow rising up for thousands of feet, r radiating itself onto a center area. If you're getting on steep snow and you're post holing up to your butt and it's very wet in these solar areas, you're out of line. You shouldn't be there. You know, you should be there when the temperatures are cold and it's, it's fairly stable. Although signs of instability and weather conditions give important clues about snow stability, often the most important information comes from the active tests you can perform on the snowpack. Test it out. If you're, you know, zigzagging up a slope, you know, be sure to kick some snow off if you can, or if you find a snow-covered stump or a little rock outcrop that gives a little extra steepness to the slope that's in a safe place. You know, ski into it, take a big jump on it, and see if you can get things to trigger. There's something that gives you a very quick indication of snow stability, and that's a little ski pole test where you poke your ski pole down into the snowpack, and it will tell you the hardness of the different layers of snow. The little armpit snow tests, or just scooping with your hands to see what the different layers are like, um, I would do them several times at the beginning of the run. Anytime I stop, just about, about it's an automatic reaction to sit there and poke the snow. You may think you have a nervous twitch or something, but uh, anytime you're on a new aspect, a new elevation, you would uh, definitely do every little thing that you can to see what the snow stability is. Well, cornices are the bomb of the backcountry. A real effective tool for testing the stability of the snow. If you can get a, maybe a refrigerator-sized block of snow rolling down the slope, you know, that's, that's a pretty good test of the slope. If nothing happens with that big block of snow rolling down the down the hill. Makes you feel a little more comfortable about skiing that slope. And uh, I tend to avoid the real big gnarly ones. I uh, work with the fresh small cornices, maybe the size of a refrigerator at the most, and uh, kind of work back from a, from a point of, real, of safety, maybe near some trees, kind of working out towards the edge. I try to get a good look at it, see how overhung it is, and uh, work in from the side of it. If I've got a rope, tie into that rope, and Definitely want to avoid the big overhanging ones and work with the smaller, fresh cornices. You can also take a piece of parachute cord or a uh, small diameter purlon and tie some uh, small knots in it and uh, use that to saw the cornices off with. Uh, maybe a 20 or 30 foot piece will uh, do a pretty good job on a cornice maybe the size of a, a Subaru or uh, one of the modern uh, Cadillacs. There are a number of other quick and easy ways to test for instabilities in the near surface snow. By stepping above a ski track, you can test how easy it is to kick a small slab onto the ski trail below. Or you can jump on the triangle of snow at the apex of each switchback. Finally, you can saw out a small block with your glove, then pull on it. All of these simple tests take only a few extra seconds, and by making a habit of continuously performing them throughout the day, they yield valuable information about how well the surface slab is bonded to the underlying snow. For deeper weak layers, however, you will need to dig down with your shovel and do more formalized snow pit tests. We can think of a snow pit as a miniature avalanche path where under controlled and safe conditions, we perform various tests to see how well the slab is bonded to the underlying snow. First, after digging the snow pit, simply feel the various layers of snow. 
the weak layers easily erode away while the strong layers stand out in relief. Then make the snow pit wall smooth and vertical. One simple test is the shovel shear test. First, make vertical cuts in the snow pit wall the same width as your shovel. A snow saw saves time, but you can also cut with the tail of a ski. Next, cut behind the block only as deep as the shovel will penetrate. Insert the shovel and pull. Don't lever on the shovel, but simply pull straight out. Pay attention only to the straight, smooth breaks which come out easily. You can look at the bottom of the block to see what kind of weak layer was involved. Shielding with your hand makes the crystals easier to see. Then, cut behind the block again and pull with the shovel until you get to the bottom of the snow pit. Although the shovel shear test is a good test for finding and identifying weak layers, there are much more reliable tests for determining the stability of the snowpack. The best single stability evaluation slope test for a backcountry skier with being the Rooch blocks. Uh, we used to do a lot of shovel tests in my own personal ski touring. We're finding now I do some shovel tests on the flats, but more and more the Rooch block is the test of choice for the slopes. In a Rooch block test, after digging a smooth snow pit wall about as wide as your skis, use the tail of a ski to cut the sides and the back. If the snow is too hard, you may have to use a shovel. The block should be isolated on all four sides and be about a ski length wide and about the length of a ski pole up the slope. Then you simply put on your skis or snowboard and step gently onto the block. Finally, you jump on the block progressively harder until it fails. And we've been studying uh, the Rooch block fairly intensively in British Columbia for the past two years now. And what we found is very much in agreement with the uh, Swiss experience. If a block releases, when you're isolating the block, when you're approaching the block, stepping into place, or the first push, then the slope is dangerous and should not be skied. If it takes either of the jumps into the air to release the block, then there's still a possibility of the slope releasing, and uh, the slope should be uh, either not skied, or you should pull out all your safety tricks, uh, use your best uh, route selection to uh, perhaps ski a less steep slope nearby, uh, but uh, it really requires full precautions. The slope is suspect if it goes on either of the first two jumps. If, uh, if it doesn't go at all, or if it only goes with a, uh, an unclean break, not a nice clean failure, or if it, you have to jump repeatedly to get it to go, then uh, there seems to be a low risk of the uh, skiers triggering avalanches on that slope. But even that is conditional. The, it depends on that you've chosen a good site, and that that's consistent with the other things that you're seeing, what you're hearing from your entire stability evaluation, everything from the numbers you get over the telephone numbers, your phone, the information you get from the telephone before you go skiing, what you see happening on the slopes around you, what you learn from poking your pole in the snow and from talking it over with friends. You need a consistent picture of snow stability before you commit yourself to skiing a, a slope. Since snow can vary markedly from place to place, where you dig a snow pit is just as important as how you dig one. The idea is to dig a snow pit in a spot representative of the slope you intend to cross. Yet the trick is doing it without putting yourself in danger. Often you can find a small representative test slope where the consequences of a slide are small. It should face the same direction and be just as steep as the slope you're interested in. You should avoid ridge lines or areas where wind has affected the snowpack. As always, when in doubt about the safety of a slope, use a belay rope. The best place to dig snow pits is about an average place. <laughs> Not too deep snow, not too shallow. <laughs> I want to have the average conditions, and um, probably on the shady slopes, not too close to the trees. Better on the way downwind side. Oh, it's very difficult to say a rule. I couldn't. I struggle with defining rules about digging snow pits, and I don't know if there are any rules. It's probably. Uh, as I say, it's an art. These days I feel better about approaching a slope from the side. If I can get on a less steep slope near the side, uh, we'll sometimes come in through a group of trees, move on to a small slope that we feel is 
similarly loaded with similar layering to the slope we want to ski and do a test there. If that looks all right, perhaps move a little bit further out onto the slope. The thing that you have to remember with snow pits is that it shows you what the snow is doing right here, right in this spot. It doesn't say anything about what's 10 feet over. And that's a very important point to remember. What I do after I dig a snow pit, I just do one snow pit to kind of find out what kind of avalanche dragon I'm dealing with. What's the basic setup? And then what I do is poke around in a lot of different other places doing quick snow pits to see how widespread that instability is. How far does it go? Is it just on north facing slopes? Just on south facing slopes? Is it very widespread? Is it just patchy? Is it just in wind loaded areas? Is it just where the sun's been shining? What's the pattern? What's the pattern distribution of the instability? That's what I'm looking for. What they wanted us to do was put a snowman in the middle of town that had an arm that had high, medium, and low. But avalanches don't work that way. It all depends on where you go. On uh, any one particular day, maybe the north faces could be extremely unstable while the south faces could be safe. It just depends on where you are. I think of stability analysis like a giant game of concentration. You've got all these panels up there and you can turn over one panel here and one panel here and one panel here and you have to guess what phrase is written behind the panels. You have to integrate all the pieces, look at all of them and know the significance of each piece. And then as you start traveling in the backcountry, again, you're picking up on clues from the terrain and the weather and the snowpack. You're listening to how the snow sounds if, between your skis, if you're on skis. You're looking ahead to see what kind of um, snow surface patterns are on the snow, what kind of wind has been acting on the snow. You're listening for any kind of hollow sounds. And you're, it's not something that has to take a lot of time, but it's something that's just constantly going on. You're constantly looking for clues. You're jumping on small little hills. Snow stability evaluation is just a fancy name for hammering on the snow pack, tweaking it a little bit, seeing how it wants to react. And it's never finished. You the whole trip, you the whole day, you still have to look for uh, unstable snow and weaknesses because the snow changes from one slope to the next, from one exposure to the next, from the sunny side to the shady side. So uh, you are uh, observation and evaluation and piecing it uh, together. Little pieces of information is never, has never ended. More likely, that sixth sense is what we call a sixth sense, is just a product of all these little snippets of information which mean nothing on their own, but all coming together and starting to build a bigger picture. And so the, so the snippets really are just colored paints that when they come together, they create this very big image in the back of your mind which says, I shouldn't be here and this is time to do something about it. What you need as a strategy for survival in the backcountry is good sound route finding. Uh, it's harder to apply than you might think because there are so many temptations to take shortcuts. Um, but the long-term survival uh, of people who repeatedly go out and ski in the, the back country, ski in avalanche terrain and so forth, is based on minimizing the risks. When I first started doing avalanche control about 15 years ago, my, I had a partner that just would drive these three rules into me. And those rules have saved my life a number of times. And the first one, of course, is one at a time. And that means uh, you also get out of the way when you get to the bottom. Second one is you never ski above your partner. Never ever ski above your partner without their permission. And the third one is always have an escape route planned. Those rules have saved my life a number of times. I always go by the premise that it's your habits that save your life. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword, I figure. If you're always pushing your luck, you're going to get caught. You're going to get caught. It's just a matter of time. But I'm always just, you know, I'm so regimented in the backcountry. There's not a time that I put my ski on a slope that I don't, that I'm not thinking avalanche. You watch a good route finder, and it's like poetry in motion. You watch how they do it. They'll go along and always choosing the gentlest terrain. That's the number one rule. Always stay on the gentlest terrain possible. For example, they're going up a ridge, and they'll be doing switchbacks back and forth on the ridge, and they won't get too far off on the sides of the ridges where the slope angle gets too steep. They'll put in more switchbacks than maybe somebody else who is less of an artist might. 
if they have to cross a slope, they'll cross it as high on the avalanche path as they can because if it breaks, then they're right near the crown and they have a chance of getting off of it. If they are choosing between two different slopes, they'll choose the one with the most anchors in them. Uh, they'll choose ones with where if it does slide, the consequence of the slide isn't nearly as bad. If I go into a new area, I always uh, tone it down right away. I don't just do it like I do at home. I uh, dig a few snow pits, I test some slopes that are low angle, and then I build my way up. And it might take one or two days worth of skiing to really feel comfortable in that kind of environment. I usually uh, start out low angle, 30, 35 degrees, and try to work my way up. And uh, you sort of sniff it out. You can't just jump on the first 50 degree slope when you don't even know the snowpack. I believe ski cutting is one of the more valuable tools that we use in guiding. In a ski cut, you generally start out on top of the run in a point of safety and you find or you eyeball a place across the hill that you can ski to and you want to keep your speed up and at the same time you're down weighting on your skis as you go across the slope but your main goal is to keep your speed up so that you do not get caught if you should cut off a small slope. In fact I do, can't remember a time where the lead guide does not ski cut the slope three or four times starting at the very top and there has been you know quite a few times when I wiped my brow and said oh I'm glad we ski cut this run. If it's really big I'll have a rope I'll be tied light rope eight millimeter something like that tie it to a tree and if you're really gonna get serious you should always carry a rope and I'll just do two or three test turns real gingerly and then uh, work my way into the, uh, the run like that instead of the all-out attack like you see in the movies. You don't attack a slope that you haven't been on. Spooning in tracks is one thing that's uh, getting increasingly important. If you approach the slope with kind of the, the minefield approach, if there's avalanches out there, maybe the first person down uh, didn't trigger any uh, potential problems and you might as well stay real close to their tracks rather than wandering all over the slope. If you're wandering all over the slope, you have a better chance of finding that mine and uh, triggering that slope. What seems to have happened in some of our larger snowmobile triggered avalanches, at least in this area, are one or more snowmobilers, usually two snowmobilers, will get up on a slope and they'll get their machines stuck. And then it seems that the avalanches have been releasing while these folks have been off of their machines and trying to pull their machines around. Now when you have two people on the same slope and they've each got a 500 pound snow machine, we're talking about putting a lot of load on one slope. When conditions are very dangerous and you can't travel to a safer place, the best choice is often to dig a snow cave or use the protection of a crevasse and wait for conditions to improve. We use ice caves all the time in the big mountains um, because you don't know what's above you and how much snow and it's better to be in a bomb shelter. Choosing a route and choosing the safest techniques for traveling on that route are no different than any other aspect of avalanches in that there are no rules of thumb. Where you go and how you do it depend on the stability of the snowpack. We can think of the snowpack stability as three different categories analogous to a traffic light. Red light, yellow light and green light. During red light conditions, the snowpack is very unstable. You may see recent avalanche activity, collapsing and cracking of the snow, and most of your snow pit tests may indicate unstable snow. In red light conditions, your route finding choices become very limited. You can only travel on gentle terrain, on slopes of about 30 degrees or less, and stay out from underneath avalanche starting zones. Often, the only way you can venture onto steeper terrain is if you're in thick trees. You should also travel only with other people who have good avalanche skills. During yellow light conditions, some slopes are very safe while others are very dangerous. For instance, just after a windstorm, wind scoured slopes are usually safe, but wind loaded slopes are very dangerous. Interestingly enough, this is when most avalanche accidents occur because people without good avalanche skills can't tell the difference between safe and dangerous slopes and they quickly get themselves into trouble. Finally, during green light conditions, the snowpack is mostly stable with only very isolated areas of avalanche hazard. This is usually the only kind of day when you can venture onto the more radical terrain and do it safely. 
But as always, only after careful evaluation. This may also be the only time to travel with larger groups of less skilled people. Unfortunately, knowing snow stability and safe travel skills isn't enough. In a disturbing percentage of avalanche accidents, although several obvious signs of instability were present, the victims either didn't notice the signs or chose to ignore them. Ultimately, most avalanche accidents come down to the human factor. In Alaska, we've been investigating avalanche accidents. And what we found is that it's not usually one or two or three clues that are being overlooked. Usually by the time people are getting into trouble, it's three or four or five clues. Usually the problems are that people are picking up on the clues, but they're making decisions on human terms. In other words, it's a blue sky day, so we want to go skiing. Or the skiing's been lousy, and we finally had a dump. Or um, this snow ranger said the avalanche hazard was moderate or you paid five hundred dollars to fly into this spot to go skiing so you're going to ski it if you're going to ski or travel safely in the backcountry you need to make your decisions on mother nature's terms we go out there with skiers eyeballs or snow machiners eyeballs and we need to go out there with avalanche eyeballs other perception traps that you can fall into is that you just believe that things are safe maybe things are dangerous there but if you believe that they're safe you're not going to see it that's the nature of perception, and that's why it's really important to keep an open mind all the time. It's real common that if someone's killed in a, on a particular slope, that people will avoid that slope, like the plague, for, for years and years afterwards. They'll talk about that slope like it's you know, a place of certain death. Well, at the same time, people are out skiing uh, nearly identical slopes, just as dangerous slopes, um, in a dangerous way. And they're not making their decisions based on fact, they're making their decisions based on feelings. I mean, I know people who basically on the summit day says nothing will stop us, the weather's good. And so only fatigue will make me turn around. So they actually shut out the idea of being able to retreat due to snow conditions. If you shut that out, then it's certainly not a nagging problem in the back of your mind until the moment you hear that wumph <laughs> and you're riding one down the mountainside. The big, the big factor in the Alaska range, as in a lot of big mountains, the key is to hurry up and wait. In big mountains, you cannot afford to be under a rush schedule. You've got to be relaxed. You've got to be willing to hang out in the tent. If it doesn't feel right for you, you stay in the tent. You know, you just can't say, well, I'm gonna miss, a, I'm gonna miss my meeting on Monday. Well, you're just gonna have to miss your meeting on Monday. But group dynamics is a, certainly an important part of avalanche avoidance. Uh, and, and the most important element of group dynamics is communication. Been on too many tours where uh, someone didn't feel right about the snow, but they didn't say anything about it, and they felt they were getting in over their heads, or they felt the snow was more unstable, but they didn't feel comfortable talking about it. And, and uh, those, to me, are the most dangerous situations where there's no communication between the individual um, members of a party. Something happens when you put a lot of people together. Uh, as soon as there's five people, you're much more willing to go into places that you normally wouldn't go. You add 10 people, and it's like you'll go anywhere. And this herding instinct is, is very important, the safety in numbers kind of thing. But it's, but it's a false sense of security because, uh, because the avalanches think just the opposite of that. The, you might feel safer with 10 people, but the avalanche feels that it's just 10 times more weight on its back, 10 times more people trying to trick the, trip the trigger on the big buffalo trap that's uh, gonna bury everybody. I think the problem with us outdoors in the West is that we're um, gear freaks. We actually think things protect us from the elements. Well, in fact, if you don't know how to use the stuff, then it doesn't at all. It just leads you into this false sense of security. And it's more important to have skills and knowledge. And then you can use your equipment. But you have to base yourself on knowledge first, equipment after. Not equipment first, knowledge after. There really has to be a lack of cockiness when you're out there. My attitude with avalanches is that they are all powerful. I have complete respect for the snow and the snowpack, and I take uh, no risks without assessing all variables.
The statistics of avalanche rescues aren't very encouraging. About a third of avalanche victims die from trauma. The other two thirds die from suffocation and about half of the completely buried victims die within the first half hour. Only 2% live long enough to die from hypothermia. That's why it's absolutely imperative to not only have good rescue skills, but to have practiced them often enough to be effective. If you are the one caught, although most of your options are already gone, there are ways to improve your chance of survival. If you trigger a slide, you've got an immediate task at hand. First, yell. Let everybody with you know that you're in a slide, that you've triggered something and it's moving all around you. So yell as loud as you can. Then you've got to get off that slab. You might think about grabbing a tree, maybe jetting off to one side, maybe grab a rock. You might be able to just dig into the bed surface. Maybe you could even run uphill, get off of that slab. But whatever you're going to do, you've got to do it right now. You've got about two seconds, and then you're going to be moving way too fast to do anything. You're going to be getting tumbled, and it's going to be all over. You're going to be going down. If you're uh, quick on your feet, you're not scared of speed. Sometimes I'll just point them, and you're going 60 miles an hour. But you might that thing's still building speed, and then you 45 degree angle out of it and let it roar by. That's if you're on it right away, if you know it's happening right underneath your feet. You feel the buckling. You feel those, the cardboard coming up in your face. So the whole idea is to fight. And I mean fight like hell, because you're fighting for your life. Now, snowmobiles sometimes have an advantage. They may actually be able to accelerate and get off the slab to the side, or even in some cases, go right down and outrun it. But if you're non-motorized, you don't have a prayer of staying ahead of that thing. Sometimes, no matter what you do, you're going to go down. Then it's a good idea not to have pole straps on. You want to be able to use your arms. You don't want to have ski straps on, safety straps, because those skis will drag you down like sea anchors. You want to keep your pack on. Your pack protects your spine. If you live through this thing, you're going to need that gear that's in that pack. And besides, the pack actually, if it's not too heavy, will float you, sort of like a um, life preserver in moving water. Speaking of water, swimming actually helps. I've talked to a lot of people that have been in slides, and they say that, that swimming, maybe even a backstroke sometimes, will keep you up in the debris. And that's the idea. You want to stay high in that moving debris, on top of it if you can. And again, it's fight. Fight like hell. Now when the snow stops moving, it's likely to set up hard as cement in just about an instant. You may not even be able to move your little finger at that point. So just as you feel the snow coming to a stop, you want to try to clear your mouth if you can, because you may have snow in it. You want to try to clear a little bit of an air space, and you want to try to get a hand to the surface. You may not even know which way is up, but if you can, try to get that hand to the top. And then you're going to be just frozen in place, more than likely. Now the idea is you really want to be a Zen master. You need to conserve energy. You want to say your mantra. You want to just make peace with yourself. Now it's all out of your hands. Now your fate is in the hands of your partners. And then all of a sudden it got real dark. and. Uh... The noise is like a wave coming over you, and then it's just this dead calm. And uh, I just guessed which way it was up and punched my arm up through, and I was under about a f two feet. And uh, I didn't have much air. There's, there's not much air in avalanche debris if it's a dense snow. Now, if the accident is reported to you by another person, don't let them get away. Hang on to them because they're going to have to show you exactly where that person went down. If you've just watched your wife or your best friend, maybe your child disappear in an avalanche, you're now faced with probably the hardest job of your life. You must not screw it up, yet there's countless pitfalls ahead. This is going to be possibly dangerous, certainly difficult, and maybe futile. Your first decision is whether you can search it all. 
if there's a lot of snow above the fracture line, you may not even be able to reach the, the slide area at all. You also want to consider if there's any other slide paths that could reach you down in the area you're going to be, you're going to be searching in. This is a particularly critical decision if the avalanche hazard is rising. If it's storming, if there's snow coming down, or maybe the temperature is rising rapidly, that avalanche hazard could be increasing. And you may simply have to go get some outside help. You may not be able to go to in there at all. This has to be your call, and it may be a tough one. Just don't get somebody else killed trying to find somebody that's already been caught in an avalanche. If you decide you can search with reasonable safety, don't send anybody for help, not even if there's 15 of you. About half of all completely buried victims die within the first 30 minutes, so an outside rescue team won't help except for digging out a dead body. This burden is entirely on your shoulders. You must make a plan. That's the first thing to do. Even if you're by yourself, you have to search in an organized manner. Probably the best way to deal with this is to have practiced it ahead of time. You need to have practiced rescue techniques. Sometimes it helps to appoint a leader, but you have to have practiced. I bring uh, three or four essential items. One is the pro pole, the shovel, the avalanche transceiver, and you've got to learn how to use that. You don't just buy one and go in the mountains. You, you have to learn how to use it. Go to the supermarket and hide it in the fruit do anything. Just go try to get used to it. You don't see a whole lot of ski movies with people with shovels and pro poles and things like that. And if you're going to be skiing those kind of radical situations, I think the ski movies should have that incorporated in the the movie itself because it was just it's an education. It's it's just common sense that you have to have these certain tools with you. Avalanche searches are a horrible dilemma and contradiction. You must not lose a second, but you must be methodical. It comes down to going fast by going slow. First of all, watch the victim as long as you can see them, and then continue to watch the snow that they were swallowed up in. They may actually end up in that same batch of snow. Now when you go in, mark the point where you last saw the person, and then search downhill from there. Check likely burial sites. They'd be things like trees, maybe benches, bins in the slide path, and then search the main debris pile. Look for clues. If you spot a glove, check to see if there's a hand in it. Line up the last seen point and any clues that you find, because that'll give you a likely trajectory that the person has, has traveled through. Immediately we started a hasty search. We did a head count. We got the, the transceivers on receive, made sure everyone was on receive, and uh, set up a team of shovels and probes, and we had that all organized in two minutes because everyone was uh, very calm about it, and there was only one person directing. And we started in, we found the first guy in a matter of a minute, and uh, didn't dig him out, just made him air hole, and then we went right to the next person, and he took about 15 minutes because he was in the, the deepest of the deposition and we got to him and luckily he had an air pocket down there he ended up being okay the best avalanche rescue of course is to never need one in the first place each year thousands of people live work and play in hazardous avalanche terrain and the vast majority live a long happy life doing so but only by rigorously applying their avalanche skills People without avalanche skills, or those who refuse to use them, will eventually become one of the statistics. But the mountain, the wind and the snow are great teachers, and paradise waits for those who know how to listen. I rode over uh, a cliff right in front of my girlfriend and uh, I was stuck up to my neck when she came down. Like a bridge of all. 
Cannonsworth's Dive. Remember that? Emily? Yeah. <laughs> she came down and goes, you taking me out to dinner tonight? <laughs> I'll dig you out. <laughs> I've noticed uh, over the years skiing with a lot of skilled avalanche people that they tend to become very conservative about this. They have a chance to ski down a nice powder slope and uh, the young, enthusiastic and untrained people will bomb down the middle and whoop it up. And, <laughs> The old hand will go over and kind of sneak down along the edge where you can get out of the slope in a hurry in case it slides. Trusting your own judgment. Oh, I have a great story for that. I was ski patrolling and it was uh, a very heavy snow morning and we were out doing control work and yet we weren't getting anything to slide. The snow was beautiful. I mean, we wanted to ski so badly and we got to our last uh, shot. We had one shot left and a beautiful slope and the patroller I was with said, well, we haven't seen any action. Let's let's just ski this. We don't want to muck it up with a, a shot. And my judgment was, we've got the shot. Let's throw it. We threw the shot. It went off. And wow, the whole thing, all the way down the chute, the trees were going like this. And he looked over at me and said, thanks, sweet cheeks. You just saved my life. Some people are lucky and some people aren't. I wouldn't travel with somebody who brags a lot about being caught in a lot of avalanches. 